podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the third webinar in our Head and Neck series. My name is Leon von Rensberg, RSFA CME Director, Congress Director. Again, uh, most of you know Dr. Richard Wiggers III from the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. For those of you who joined us for the first time, Dr. Wiggins is Professor of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at the University of Utah and an adjunct professor in departments of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and biomedical informatics. He is currently the program chair of the Society of Imaging and Informatics and Medicine. Dr. Wiggins is CAQ certified in neuroradiology by the American Board of Radiology and certified by the American Board of Imaging and Informatics. We are really so privileged to have a person of the standing and stature of uh, Dr. Wiggins to give his free time to do the series for us. And thank you once again, uh, Rita, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Von Uh So uh, we talked before about uh, some of the complicated areas in the head and neck and the cervical soft tissues. Uh, so today we're going to start talking about temporal bone. So we're going to talk about anatomy first, and then in the next lecture we'll talk about pathology, and then we'll go over the post-operative temporal bone, which is a very complicated subject. Uh, so I have nothing significant to, dis uh, to disclose about the temporal bone. So we're going to talk about the importance of anatomy around the temporal bone and discuss some of the important nerves that go through the temporal bone and kind of review the imaging characteristics. This is an area where, as an imager, we make a significant impact on patient care because of our ability to make very good differentials sometimes on the anatomy and pathology of the temporal bone. If I have a well-done non-contrasted CT with bone algorithm and a well-done contrasted MRI, I can sometimes tell you exactly what the pathology is. And that's a very exciting thing for us to be able to do as imagers. So uh, we're gonna talk about the anatomy this time. In our next lecture, we'll talk about some of the common pathologies. And then in the, the next lecture after that, we'll talk about post-operative imaging of the temporal bone. So when we think about the skull base itself, we can think about vague general areas like the anterior, the middle, and the posterior cranial fossa. Or we can think about the individual bones with the paired frontal bones and the parietal bones and the temporal bones and the unpaired ethmoid, the sphenoid and the occipital bones in the back. So we're gonna focus on these next couple of lectures just on the temporal bone here out laterally. And we have a very complicated inferior attachment of the skull base with all these foramen. And as we talked about before with cranial nerves, we wanna see a nice fat pad below each foramen when we're thinking about cranial nerves especially with perineural tumor spread, when we think about the nerves going up through these foramen of the skull base. And we remember again, these complicated attachments with the sphenoid bone here and the temporal bone out laterally, this important osseous anatomy that's around the infra aspect of the temporal bone. So we can think about the temporal bone just starting from the outside and going in, or we can think about the individual osseous components. If we think about the individual bones, we think about five main segments that make up the temporal bone itself. There's a squamous portion, a mastoid, a petrous, a tympanic, and a styloid portion of the temporal bone that happen in that area. So the squamous portion we think about as the floor of the adult suprazygomatic masticator space. So when we talked last time about the infrazygomatic and the suprazygomatic masticator space, that squamous portion of the temporal bone is the floor of that. And from intracranially, that's the lateral wall of the middle cranial fossa. The mastoid portion develops after birth, and we have some important anatomic landmarks, especially when we're thinking about CT of this important anatomy at that area, where we think about the middle ear ossicles in the middle ear. Posteriorly, we have the narrowing, the aditus ad antrum, or opening to the cave, and then we have the mastoid antrum, the largest air cell, more posteriorly. And we usually think about that air cell being posterior to the middle air cavity when we see the ice cream cone itself of the ossicles. We know we're at the epitympanum at that level. 
Now, the lateral wall of the middle ear cavity in the mastoid antrum, we sometimes think about as the petrosquamosal suture or Kerner septum. That's a relatively good barrier for infection, but it's also a surgical landmark when we think about that lateral edge at that location. That's the petrosquamosal suture. Now, the petrous portion of the temporal bone is the complicated area where we think about the inner ear and the otocapsule in those structures. And we know that we have very complicated anatomy with all these vascular structures. Here we see the transverse sinus going to the sigmoid, and we have a superior and an inferior petrosal sinus that are draining the cavern as sinuses on both sides and this complicated venous plexus that's behind the, the clivus. Now we have the tegmentipity and the arcuate eminence, the support and osseous structure on the roof of the temporal bone there. So when we think about the roof and the coronal view, you have the tegment tympany, the roof of the middle air cavity, and the arcuate eminence, which is, which is an important surgical landmark, the little bump that's over the superior semicircular canal. So that's important anatomy when we look at the coronal CT. On the posterior surface of the petrous portion, we have the opening of the internal auditory canal, or the pleurus acousticus, and we have two little channels or aqueducts, the vestibular aqueduct and the cochlear aqueduct, that we think about as potential routes of spread. So there are these small channels where we think about infection potentially spreading, like from meningitis, to the inner ear structures. On the inferior surface, we have the carotid and the internal jugular vein immediately below the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So very important anatomy where we may have pathology from the carotid or the internal jugular vein that may affect the petrous portion of the temporal bone at that level. We can think about the tympanic portion of the temporal bone as just a small U-shaped bone that forms the osseous floor of the adult external auditory canal itself. So that little part there we think about is the tympanic portion. Then we have the styloid portion that also develops after birth with the mastoid tip and the styloid and the mastoid process protect the stylomastoid foramen where cranial nerve seven is coming out. So the styloid portion and the mastoid portion we think about as subunits of the temporal bone itself. Now, another way to think about the temporal bone is to think about all of these segments as we go from external to internal. So we can start with the external auditory canal and then we'll discuss the middle ear and then we'll discuss the inner ear. So we'll start here with the external auditory canal. And we think about that canal having a lateral fibrocartilaginous portion and a medial osseous portion that extends up to the tympanic membrane. So we think about all of that as the external auditory canal. So that tympanic membrane is going from the scutum or shield, that's the superior attachment, down to the tympanic annulus, that's the inferior attachment of the tympanic membrane we see here in this graphic. And very importantly, the lymphatics we think about from the external auditory canal extend inferiorly to the parotid gland. The parotid, as we talked about before, is different from the other salivary glands and the upper air digestive tract in the cervical soft tissues because the parotid has lymph nodes in it and the other salivary glands don't. So here on a CT, we've got a magnified view in the coronal plane and we see the scutum, the superior attachment of the tympanic membrane and the tympanic membrane goes down to the tympanic annulus inferiorly. So that's the inferior attachment of the tympanic membrane. And there's a portion that we often describe superiorly as being more flaccid, so that's the pars flaccida, and a part that's more tense inferiorly, that's the pars tensa. And when we talk next time about cholesteatomas that may be acquired from the tympanic membrane, that becomes important in how that affects the surrounding anatomy. So next we have the middle ear itself. So in the inside the middle ear cavity is where we have our obstacles. And we sometimes divide the middle ear into different segments. So there's an epitympanum or roof, there's a mesotympanum or middle part or tympanic cavity proper, and a hypotympanum down at the bottom. So when we think about a coronal CT, and if we draw a line from the tip of the scutum over to the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, and we draw a line across the floor of the osseous EAC, that's going to separate for us the epitympanum on top from the mesotympanum on bottom and the hypotympanum on bottom. So on, on very bottom, we have the hypotympanum, which is normally just air-filled, 
uh, but it is very close to both the carotid and the internal jugular vein. So we can have pathology from those regions go up into the hypotympidum, the bottom of the middle air cavity. So the top is the epitympidum, the middle part is the mesotympidum, and the bottom is the hypotympidum of the separation of the middle ear cavity. So we can think about that middle ear cavity as a box. We have a box that we think about as in three dimensions. So we have structures surrounding it on each side. So anteriorly, we think about the temporal fossa. Posteriorly, we have the mastoid air cells. Superiorly is the roof, the tegma tympani. Inferiorly, you have the carotid and the jugular vein. Laterally, we have our trypanic membrane. And medially, we have the otic capsule. So this is dense as bone in the body, should be bright white all the time around the cochlea and the vestibule at that level. So we have the cochlear promontory, the osseous bump that's over the cochlea, and we have the lateral semicircular canals that form the medial wall of the middle ear cavity, if we think about that as a three-dimensional box. So if we were to be within the middle ear cavity and we look medially, we see that cochlear promontory and we have the eustachian tube extending in anteriorly with the tensor tympani muscle that travels parallel to the eustachian tube. And here we see the stapes with the anterior, the posterior cura going to the oval window. So this is the cochlear promontory, the medial wall of the middle ear cavity. And if we look laterally, we see the tympanic membrane. So here's our malleus going up. Here's the incus coming down that articulates with the stapes. And here's our eustachian tube now extending anteriorly with the tensor tympani that connects to the long process or the manubrium of the malleus. Now, when we look in and we think about otoscopic examination with our light reflex, we think about where those ossicles are and their attachment of the tympanic membrane at the umbo or indwelling at the bottom of the manubrium. And here a resected graphic where we've resected the tympanic membrane. We see that long process of the manubrium going up and the long process of the incus going down where the anterior and the posterior cura of the stapes go up to the oval window. So we can see and imagine these structures in a patient who has a widely perforated tympanic membrane. Now those three ossicles are held together in the middle ear by suspensory ligaments. We think about four suspensory ligaments, but some neuroontologists think it's variable that there may be up to eight, but we have a superior and anterior and a lateral that connect to the malleus. So when we think about our ice cream cone that we like to see in the epitympidum, the top of the middle ear cavity, the ice cream scoop is the head of the malleus and the ice cream cone is the short process of the incus. So there are three suspensory ligaments we think about connecting to the malleus. There's an anterior and a superior that connect to the head of the malleus. And there's a lateral suspensory ligament that connects to the neck of the malleus. And then posteriorly off the back of the short process of the incus, or the cone in our ice cream cone, we have a posterior suspensory ligament. So those are the four main and most commonly seen suspensory ligaments on imaging. But again, some people think that it is variable. There may be up to eight suspensory ligaments holding those ossicles in place. So we'll look at each of these segments, the epitympidum, the mesotympidum, and the hypotympidum. So first we have the epitympidum, that's the top or the roof. Again, if we draw a line from the tip of the scutum over the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, above that is the epitympidum. So when I see the ice cream cone, I know I'm at the level of the epitympidum of the middle ear cavity. So the ice cream scoop is the head of the malleus and the cone is the short process of the incus. We also have the lateral uh, epitympanic recess or lateral attic at this level, often described as Prusak space between the scutum and the head of the malleus. The space that Prusak technically was describing was actually between the neck of the malleus and the top of the TM, but people often describe the space between the scutum and the head of the malleus as Prusak space. We also often see a septation anteriorly when we're near the level of the ice cream cone that we often call an anterior air cell or the COG. The COG, C-O-G, is a good surgical landmark in the uh, epitympanum. So we have a epitympanic lateral recess, often called Prusak space, and we have an anterior air cell that's often called the cog, that is a good surgical landmark. So if we see a septation more in this plane, anterior to the head of the malleus, that's sometimes called the cog at that level. 
So here again is our view of a perforated tympanic membrane. Just to remind us that we have three ossicles, we have four suspensory ligaments, and we also have two muscles that we think about as holding the ossicles in place. So we have two muscles, the tensor tympani with V3 innervation goes to the long process or the maneuvering with the malleus. And we have the stapedius muscle that comes from cranial nerve seven in the back that goes to the superstructure of the stapes. So we have three ossicles. We have four suspensory ligaments, might be variable, might be up to eight. And we have two muscles that we think about as holding all of those ossicles in place. On the back wall of the middle ear cavity, we have three important areas that we talk about. If we find the descending or mastoid segment of the facial nerve, there's an ear filled recess next to that. That's often called the facial nerve recess. Immediately medial to that, there is a small pyramidal shaped bump that we can call the pyramidal eminence. And that's where we think about is the stapedius muscle arising from the facial nerve extending towards it. And we think about the region from the oval and round windows over to the pyramidal eminence as the sinus tympani. So that sinus tympani, the pyramidal and the facial nerve recess are all important areas on the back wall of the middle ear cavity, especially if we think about the surgeon approaching through the external auditory canal. It's hard to make this turn and look at those structures on the back wall. So especially in pathology, and we'll talk next about some pathology like cholesteatoma, if there is residual cholesteatoma at this site, it's our job to try to mention it because it's hard for the surgeon to see the facial nerve recess, the pyramidal eminence, and the sinus tympani in that region. So next we have the ossicles. So we have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes with the anterior and the posterior occur at that level. So here are the ossicles all separated. So we can think about the long process of the maneuver of the malleus going down to connect to the tympanic membrane at the umbo or indwelling. That goes up to the head of the malleus that connects to the short process of the incus. The long process of the incus has a hook on the end that articulates with the superstructure of the stapes that has an anterior and a posterior cura that go to the stapes footplate that connects to the oval window. So we have mechanical dynamics from the relatively large surface area of the tympanic membrane connecting to the very small surface area of the umbo of the manubrium that has a larger surface area of the head of the malleus that connects to a small surface area at the superstructure of the stapes that connects to a much larger surface area of the foot plate. So we think about hearing all being transmitted through these functional units. So again, here's a real otoscopic exam of the tympanic membrane through the external auditory canal. Here we have a nice light reflex and we can see the long process of the manubrium. So if we have a perforated tympanic membrane, we can sometimes actually see all these structures. So here's that long process of the manubrium through this perforated tympanic membrane. This one is widely perforated, obviously. And we see that long process of the incus going down to connect to the superstructure of the stapes. And we can actually see that posterior and anterior cura going up to the oval window. So below that is gonna be the cochlear promontory, the bump immediately below it. So in a widely perforated tympanic membrane on otoscopic view, we can actually see these structures. So if we're following these ossicles in the coronal plane, again, we think about the tympanic annulus and the scutum as being the attachment to the tympanic membrane. The manubrium connects from there and goes up to the head of the malleus. And the long process of the incus goes down, has a little hook on the end that we see nicely on the coronal view that goes over to the oval window. So in the coronal view, we see this duck head shape on the coronal view. So the head of the duck is a vestibule. The beak is a lateral semicircular canal and the neck of the duck is going down to the basal turn of the cochlea at that level. So we can see those, the anatomic structures very nicely. When we think about it in the axial view, here we see the long process of the manubrium connecting to the tympanic membrane, and we can follow that long process up superiorly to get to the head of the malleus. That connects to the short process of the incus, and then we have the long process of the incus going down to connect to the superstructure of the stapes and we see the anterior and the posterior cura going over to the oval window. So if we have a study that we think was done well, we can see the anterior and posterior cura of the stapes. If we see them too well, we might be suspicious that that patient has a component of tympanosclerosis or scarring 
if some of those structures may be scarred down. In this cut, we also see that tensor tympany that has a little hook on the end that connects over to the long process or the manubrium of the malleus. So I want to see a nice ice cream cone up high. The ice cream scoop, again, is the head of the malleus, and the cone is the short process of the incus. So I want to be sure that I see a nice ice cream cone when I look very high at the imaging of the epitympanum, so I know that I'm at that level. As I go below the ice cream cone, I see two dots, like a colon, the punctuation colon, not the GI tract colon. So we see those two dots. The dot in front is the long process of the manubrium of the malleus, and the dot in front is the long process of the incus. As I keep going down to the bottom of the mesotympanum, I kind of see an equal sign. There's two lines that are parallel, like an equal sign at that level. So the line in front is the long process of the manubrium that has a little hook on the end, sometimes called the umbo, and the line in back is the hook of the bottom of the incus and the stapy superstructure. So we want to see a nice ice cream cone, and then we want to see a nice colon, and then below that we want to see an equal sign at the bottom, below the ice cream cone, to see that normal anatomy. So that's the mesotympanum of the ossicles. So down below those structures, we really just have the hypotympanum. That's normally just air filled, but it's a very important area because we want to be sure we have a nice osseous bar separating both the carotid and the jug from the hypotympanum. Theoretically, if we think about this anatomy and we acquire our images straight in the coronal plane, under the cochlea starts with a C, should be the carotid, and under the vestibule starts with a V, should be a vein. So we remember the anatomy anatomy in that way. So that's the middle ear. So we've got three ossicles. We have at least four suspensory ligaments that we like to see on imaging. And we have two muscles that hold those ossicles in place at that level. So next we have the inner ear structures. So we have the vestibule and the cochlea and the semicircular canals that are all surrounded by the motor capsule, densest bone in the body. So it should be bright white all the time when we look at those structures. So here's an axial CT. So we talked about the external auditory canal, then we talked about the middle ear cavity, and now we're gonna talk about the inner ear structures. So we have the otic capsule, the densest bone in the body should be bright white, and that's around the cochlea and the vestibule and the semicircular canals. Now this anatomy is very important in addition to being complicated. We have all these fluid filled structures but because this bone is so dense, I wanna be sure when I evaluate CTs of the skull base and the temporal bone, that I have a very wide window. I want a window level setting, something like 4,400, so that I can see subtle osseous changes of the otic capsule, the dense bone, that's around the cochlea and the vestibule. So we have all of these fluid filled structures that are connected. So we have perilymph and endolymph, the fluid that is within these structures. The vestibule, we think about anatomically as being up of two parts, the utricle and the saccule. Each of our semicircular canals has a small swelling or ampulla that we think about the little otoliths or stones being within it. And we think about the perilymph and the endolymph being shared between the vestibule and the cochlea, the two and a half or two and three quarter turns of the cochlea spiral. And we remember that we have the vestibular aqueduct and the cochlear aqueduct that are potential routes of spread they may also connect to these fluid-filled structures inside of the otic capsule, dense as bone in the body. So here's an axial graphic. When we think about the internal auditory canal and the cochlear nerve and the vestibular nerves, we have the cochlea here with our two and a half or two and three quarter turns. And in the back, we have our vestibule. So the vestibule is made up of two parts, the utricle and the saccule. And we have our three semicircular canals extending off of the vestibule. So there's a lateral, a superior, and a posterior semicircular canal. And each of those we think about as having an ampulla or swelling. And then we have our endolymphatic duct and sac that extends posteriorly from the vestibule. Embryologically, it turns out there's only a couple of millimeters that's really duct. The rest of it is actually all sac on pathology. But we think about it is the endolymphatic duct and sac. And as an internal standard, we want that endolymphatic duct and sac to be less wide then the semicircular canal is wide at that level. And all of our semicircular canals we think about as being 90 degrees perpendicular to each other. 
So if you look at the walls of the room where they meet the ceiling, you can see they're all 90 degrees to each other. And one semicircular canal on one side is 90 degrees perpendicular to one on the other side. So with rotatory acceleration, we have excitatory flow on one side and inhibitory on the other to help us tell that we have acceleration and rotation. So here's a coronal graphic again showing the duck head shape. So the head of the duck is a vestibule, the beak is a lateral semicircular canal, and the neck is a basal turn of the cochlea. And again, we have our tympanic membrane here from the scutum to the tympanic annulus. We have our malleus going up, the incus coming down, and then the stapes with the anterior and posterior cura going to the oval window at that site. So here's the duck head again in the coronal plane. So here is a duck. This is the head of the duck. So the head of the duck is a vestibule. That's where we see the oval window, where the stapes should be going up. The neck of the duck is the basal, is the lateral semicircular canal, and the sorry, the beak of the duck is a lateral semicircular canal, and the neck of the duck is going down to the basal turn of the cochlea that forms the cochlear promontory of the otic capsule. So we think about all of these fluid-filled structures as combining between the vestibule and the semicircular canal. And each of the semicircular canals has an ampulla or swelling. And we think about the perilymph and the endolymph flowing inside of all of these structures. So here we have the cochlea, here we have the vestibule, and then we have a superior, a posterior, and a lateral semicircular canal that extend off the vestibule, which we think of as having two different parts, the utricle and the saccule. that connect over to those structures at that level. And we have these different chambers within the cochlea. So the modialis, the cochlear nerve that allows us to hear. So very thin chambers here. We think about perilymph being within the scala vestibuli and scala tympani, and endolymph being within the scala media, and the very thin vestibular membrane or Reisner's membrane separating scala vestibuli from scala media. And we're almost to the point where we can actually see these different chambers on routine MRI imaging. This is a 3T imaging study, and I see the modialis, the bow tie in the middle of the cochlea, and I see the cochlea. Clear nerve connectivity in the scala media on imaging. So I can almost hallucinate these structures. So that's a very exciting thing to be able to see these different scalar chambers and think about those little one inner and three outer rows of hair cells that go to the spiral ganglia that populate the modialis and those spiral ganglia all coalesce to form the cochlear nerve that goes through the opening here posterior to the modialis called the cochlear nerve canal. And then the cochlear nerve goes into the internal auditory canal. So if I were to take the cochlea and unravel it, I would see this shape. So this is a cochlea that's been unrolled. And I have in the middle the scala media, and I have the perilymph on the outside. So in red here, I could think about perilymph and in blue, I can think about endolymph in the middle. So I have scala vestibuli on top and scala tympani on bottom and the scala media in the middle. So net connecting to the scala vestibuli is where I think about my oval window. So that's where my stapes is gonna be. And the scala tympani is where I think about my round window at that location. So I have a fluid dynamics that extends through the perilymph when I think about the stapes pushing in on the oval window and the round window com compensating and extending out from that location. So very complicated process. If you think about everything that's occurring with those sound waves being transmitted to the pinna of your ear through the external auditory canal, those sound waves are then moving the tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane then moves the malleus. The malleus is gonna transmit to the incus, to the stapes, and that's gonna fire off repeatedly at the oval window. 
So we can think about the oval window going in as the round window goes out, and those fluid dynamics are transmitted into the cochlea and the vestibule. So if we think about zooming in on the cochlea itself, we can think again about that frequency. So we have kind of a low frequency at the apex and a high frequency at the base of the cochlea, and somewhere in there, the basilar membrane is gonna fire off maximally. And if we think about zooming in on one little part of those scalar chambers, we have our one inner and three outer rows of hair cells that are going to vibrate maximally somewhere along that two and a half or two and three quarter turns. And those hair cells that are firing off are gonna go down to the spiral ganglia that populate the modialis. And that nerve is going to fire off the cochlear nerve that goes to the auditory cortex uh, up by crossing over to the other side. So a very complicated process that is hearing itself. So that nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve, we think about as having different segments. So we have a vestibular portion and we have a cochlear portion. So we have a balance portion with the vestibular nerves and we have a hearing portion with the cochlear nerve. So here's an, again another graphic of all those spiral ganglia that live in the modialis, the bow tie, in the middle of the cochlea, and those all coalesce together to form the cochlear nerve that goes over in the internal auditory canal. So here is our cochlear nerve, the largest nerve we usually think about being in the internal auditory canal, but we also have a superior and an inferior vestibular nerve. So we can think about that superior and inferior vestibular nerve going to all of the vestibular structures more laterally. So we remember that that vestibule is made up of two parts, the utricle and the saccule, and then we have three ampulla or swelling of the semicircular canals. So we have three nerves that go to those ampulla and we have a saccular nerve and we have a utricular nerve that are all supplied by the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve. Now we used to think about the lateral aspect of the internal auditory canal that we see here on this axial CT is the macula cribosa. We usually used to think about it as Swiss cheese. There were just all these holes that those nerves were perforate and extend into. But if we look closely, we can actually see these different chambers that connect over to the vestibule and the lateral semicircular canal that we see here at this level. So near the level of the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, we can see on routine imaging the superior vestibular canal. That actually houses all three branches of the superior vestibular nerve. So there's a utricular nerve, there is a superior semicircular canal ampullary nerve and a lateral semicircular canal ampullary nerve that all go through the superior vestibular canal. Now, more inferiorly, where we think about where the cochlear nerve canal is and the modialis, the bow tie in the middle of the cochlea, that's where the cochlear nerve goes through. Near that level, there's a very small channel anteriorly. That is the inferior vestibular canal, and that just holds the saccular nerve as it goes in anteriorly towards the saccule. Now more posterior to that, there's a little channel that comes off the back wall of the internal auditory canal laterally. We see nicely here in this view on this axial CT, that's the singular canal. And that goes over towards the ampulla or swelling of the posterior semicircular canal. So that houses the posterior semicircular canal ampullary nerve. And this is just a routine CT with submillimeter sections we can routinely see these different channels so we can get a better idea of the superior and the inferior vestibular nerves and their different canals as they go over towards those inner ear structures. So this is just a routine study. This is not a special uh, sequence. This is just routine imaging where we can see those structures. Now, when we think about the internal auditory canal, if we do a cross section through that level, this is posterior, that's the cerebellum. So this is anterior, this is superior, and this is inferior. We think about the four different nerves in a mid portion of the IAC, and we can remember it by seven up and coke down. So the facial nerve is on top, the cochlear nerve is on bottom, and at the midpoint, often the superior and the inferior vestibular nerves are combined in the back. And we remember that those nerves from the cochlea and the superior and the inferior vestibular nerves go to their nuclei within the pons at the midbrain. So the seventh and eighth cranial nerves enter the bottom of the pons above the bottomedullary junction. And we can think specifically about hearing those going over to their main nuclei. They cross over to the other side at the level of the pons 
and then they extend up to the brain to the auditory cortex. So a very complicated process when we think about everything that has to happen for normal hearing to occur at this level. So similarly for the vestibular canal, here we see the combined the superior and the inferior vestibular nerves. So out laterally, they separate into a superior and an inferior vestibular nerve. The superior vestibular nerve has its three branches. So there's a lateral semicircular canal ampulla that has an ampullary nerve. There is a superior semicircular canal ampulla or swelling that has the ampullary nerve. And there's a utricular nerve that has its own nerve at that level. The inferior vestibular nerve is divided up into two nerves. So there's a small saccular nerve that we think about going through the inferior vestibular canal. And there's a singular canal that we think about as housing the posterior semicircular canal ampullary nerve that goes to the posterior semicircular canal ampulla or swelling. So all of those five distal branches come together. They're connected to one nerve and they have four nuclei centrally and we just name them by their location. So one's on top, so that's superior, one's on bottom, so he's inferior. One is medial, so that's the medial nerve, and one is lateral, so that's the lateral nuclei of the vestibular system. And we can, again, almost see all of these structures. So here's nicely the modialis, the bow tie in the middle of the cochlea. So that modialis is populated by the spiral ganglia. All the spiral ganglia coalesce to form the cochlear nerve canal. And then again, we think about the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve going over towards the vestibule and the semicircular canals. So on CT, we're going to nicely see the modialis and the opening for the cochlear nerve, the cochlear nerve canal, as it extends into the internal auditory canal. We look for that little canal, the singular canal, that houses the posterior semicircular canal ampullary nerve that comes off the posterior aspect of the lateral internal auditory canal. And those nerves continue through the internal auditory canal through the opening of the porous acousticus. So we see nicely at this level, more superiorly, if we think about where the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve is, that's where the superior vestibular canal is going to be. And that extends towards the anterior aspect of the vestibule where we see the lateral semicircular canal. And we want the osseous bar on the inner ring of the lateral semicircular canal to be wider right to left then the vestibule is right to left. So that is a commonly missed abnormality with aplasia or hypoplasia of the lateral semicircular canal when there is no osseous bar or that osseous bar is smaller right to left, then the vestibule is right to left. Now on MRI, on a CSF bright sequence, if that's a fiesta, a kiss, a space, a T2FSE, whatever sequence you use for a CSF bright thin sequence, we're going to see those nerves better with a cisternal segment through the CP angle cistern and a canalicular segment through the IAC itself. So here we see the cochlear nerve going up and then the vestibular nerve in the back that we can actually follow here going through towards the front of the vestibule at that level. So we're going to see the vestibular and the canalicular segments of both the seventh and the eighth nerves best on our CSF bright sequences. So that's the cochlear nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve. So we'll finish up with the facial nerve in the last couple of minutes. The facial nerve is a very complicated nerve and it has a tortuous course through the temporal bone itself. So there's a cisternal segment through the CP angle cistern. There's a canalicular segment through the interlauditory canal. There's a labyrinthine or fallopian segment that turns anteriorly to the geniculate ganglion. That's where the greater superficial petrosal nerve comes off. And then we have a tympanic segment that goes back under the lateral semicircular canal. Then we have a descending or mastoid segment to come out the extracranial portions and the pes serenus to go through the parotid itself. So the facial nerve has a very tortuous course as it extends through the intratemporal segments. And this is a mixed nerve. We think about a majority being branchial motor. So the muscles of voluntary and involuntary facial expression, as well as some other muscles. But we also have some parasympathetic visceral innervation. And we have special sensory that we think about as taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So a majority of the nerve, we think about the pes anserinus, all the fibers that extend out through the parotid gland itself, 
as the voluntary and involuntary muscles of facial expression, but we do have some other muscles that we think about as most commonly being innervated by the facial nerve itself. And we also have visceral motor, parasympathetic fibers, mostly going to lacrimation along the greater superficial mitral nerve, but we have some fibers that continue and travel along with the corda tympani to provide similar visceral motor or parasympathetic innervation to the submandibular and the sublingual glands. Then we have special sensory taste that we think about a majority of the corda tympani that joins the anterior division of V3, we'll talk about later, from the trigeminal nerve to become the lingual nerve to supply taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So the facial nerve is a mixed nerve with different functions. And if we think about a cross section through the pons and where the fourth ventricle is, we have these bumps on the front of the fourth ventricle, often called the facial colliculi. The motor nucleus below that is six, and the fibers of six travel anteriorly to come out the pontomedullary junction. The motor nucleus of seven is actually anterior and lateral to the motor nucleus of six, and an axial graphic we see here through the pons. And the fibers of seven do kind of a stupid thing. They start in the wrong direction, and they wrap around six to come out the bottom of the pons, usually above the pontomedullary junction. And they pass in between the superior salivatory nucleus and the solitary tract or solitary nucleus. And those fibers all come out and join together, wrapped in one perineurium as it comes out, the lateral pons. So often we think about these netter graphics. Here, if we resect the cerebellum, we see those facial colliculi, the bumps on the front of the fourth ventricle just above the stria medullaris. So the motor nucleus of six is gonna be below those fibers. And here on an anterior graphic, we see the pons and we see the medulla. So these are the fibers of six coming out the pontomedullary junction. And it's often drawn with the fibers of seven and eight coming out the lateral pontomedullary junction. If you look closely at imaging, you'll see that they more commonly come out a little bit above that from the bottom of the pons. But often you'll see them depicted in graphics as seven and eight coming out the pontomedullary junction. So we have the seventh nerve here that's above the cochlear nerve in the internal auditory canal. So that's going to go superiorly and anteriorly in the internal auditory canal. And we have a labyrinthine segment that's going to go forward to the anterior turn or genu. That's where the greater superficial vitrosal nerve comes off. Mostly we think about as parasympathetic fibers going to the lacrimal gland. Then we have the rest of the fibers in the tympanic segment of the facial nerve that goes just under the lateral semicircular canal. Then we have a descending or mastoid segment after the posterior turn or genu. And we have two branches that come off the descending or mastoid segment. That's the pedius that we mentioned earlier. And we have the corda tympani that oddly does a loop through the middle ear cavity, often depicted as going in between the malleus and the incus to come out the small fissure anteriorly at the middle ear cavity. The rest of those motor fibers continue down and come out the stylomastoid foramen and then enter the, the back of the parotid to pierce the parotid itself and split in the pezan serenus, the goose's foot, and all the branches that extend through the parotid gland itself. So that's the tortuous course of the facial nerve. We want to keep this in mind because the anatomy along all these segments is very different. So next time on our next lecture, when we talk about temporal bone pathology, we'll see how pathology of these nerves may look very different depending on which segment of the facial nerve the lesion is arising from. So here's just another graphic depiction of that. So we think about an intraaxial segment. We have a cisternal segment through the CP angle cistern of the facial nerve. We have a canalicular segment through the IAC. We have a labyrinthine segment turning forward to the geniculate ganglion. That's where the greater superficial vitrosal, those parasympathetic fibers are coming off. Then we have a tympanic segment that goes back just under the lateral semicircular canal through the temporal bone. So here we see that tympanic segment going back under the lateral semicircular canal. And when we think about it in the coronal view, here's the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve coming towards us. And here's the tympanic segment just under the beak of the duct or the lateral semicircular canal. That's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve going back under the beak. And then we have a posterior genu back posteriorly and then a descending or mastoid segment that extends inferiorly. So here again is a graphic depiction of the structures we talked about earlier. 
we have the recess next to the facial nerve. That's the facial nerve recess. There's a bump kind of shaped like a pyramid. That's where the pyramidal eminence is. That's where we think about the stapedius branch of the uh, facial nerve coming up. And we think about from the area from the pyramidal eminence over towards the oval and round window as the sinus tympani. So that's very important anatomy of the back wall of the mastoid air cells. So if we're looking at an axial CT and we scroll up and down near the level of the external auditory canal, we can think about that descending or mastoid segment being near that level. It looks like there's one air cell that's completely opacified extending down. That's gonna be our descending or mastoid segment at that level. So again, here's that netter graphic we looked at earlier. So here's that tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Here's a greater superficial patrol. So coming off the parasympathetic fibers, mostly going to visceral parasympathetic innervation of the lacrimal gland. Then from our descending mastoid segment, we have two branches. Here we see the little stapedius branch to the stapedius muscle that goes to the stapes. And here we see that corda tympani. The corda tympani makes a sharp turn, 180 degree turn. And we think about it kind of looping through the middle ear between the malleus and the incus to go out anteriorly. Uh, so here's another graphic where we see that corda tympani branch going up. And we think about the little stapedius muscle from seven and the little tensor tympani from V3 that comes anteriorly to the long process or the maneuvering of the malleus. We want to see a nice fat pad under each of the foramen of the skull base. So the small hole in between the styloid and the mastoid process, the stylomastoid foramen where the facial nerve comes out, and then it pierces the back of the parotid to extend lateral to it, the surgeons will use that facial nerve to divide the parotid into a superficial and a deep lobe. We can't always see the facial nerve in the parotid, so we often use the retromandibular vein to separate the parotid into a superficial and a deep lobe because we know that the facial nerve goes just lateral to that retromandibular vein. Then we have these branches that extend out through the face. So we think about the temporal, the buccal, the zygomatic, the mandibular, the cervical, and the occipital branch all those branches of the facial nerve as they divide in the pes anserinus, the goose's foot, that is within the parotid itself. So again, on imaging, on those CSF right sequences, that's where we're gonna see the cisternal and the canalicular segments of the facial nerve bent. And we remember again how they're divided. So when we get to the CP angle cistern, we often see some flow voids of aica loop, and we see the facial nerve and the combined vestibular cochlear nerve as we keep going laterally, when we get to the porous acousticus, the opening of the IC, we see the facial nerve and the combined vestibular cochlear nerve back posteriorly. As we get to the midpoint of the internal auditory canal, that's where we remember seven up and coke down. So facial nerve is on top, cochlear nerve is on bottom, and we have the combined vestibular cochlear nerve in the back. And then we have the facial nerve going into the labyrinthine segment. We have the cochlear nerve going to the modialis and the middle of the cochlea, and we have the vestibule that we think about all those semicircular canals extending off with the superior and the inferior vestibular canal. So when we do a CT, that's where we're going to see those osseous segments of the facial nerve best. So here we see that little labyrinthine segment coming forward to the geniculate ganglion. Then we have our tympanic segment going back under the lateral semicircular canal. Then we have a posterior genu and then we have a descending or mastoid segment that extends inferiorly. So when we look at the level of the external auditory canal, if we scroll up and down on the axial views, we'll see what looks like one mastoid air cell that's opacified all the way up and down. That is the descending or mastoid segment of the facial nerve at that level. If we do a, a, a resection or a reconstruction, of the temporal bone in that area along the course of the tympanic segment, we can sometimes get a nice view of that tympanic segment going back to the posterior genu and then the descending mastoid segment going down to the hole in between the styloid and the mastoid process. So this is the posterior genu with that descending or mastoid segment. And we can think about the little branches that come off at that level. Here again is our descending or mastoid segment of the facial nerve. So the recess air filled next to that is going to be our facial nerve recess. We think about the bump next to that as being the pyramidal eminence, and that's where we have the little stapedius branch come off 
and go towards the superstructure of the stapes. So here nicely we see the anterior and posterior cura of the stapes. And again, from the pyramidal eminence medially over to the windows, we think about that area as the sinus tympani. So if I want to find the round window, I find the basal turn of the cochlea. And if I look posteriorly and laterally, there should be a dot of air. That is where the round window is at that level. So if I want to find the oval window, I find that duck head in the coronal view that we looked at earlier. If I find, want to find the round window, I look posteriorly and laterally to the basal turn of the cochlea. And where I see here, that's where the round window is. So here's another graphic where we think about those three main cranial nuclei that contribute to the facial nerve itself. So we can think about blue here is the solitary tract or solitary nucleus, that special sensory taste going through, having a sharp turn for the corda tympani that drapes through the middle ear cavity. We can think about in yellow here being the branchial motor fibers that extend all the way through, which is the one branch, the stapedius, that comes out the stylomastoid foramen. And here in pink or purple, we can think about those parasympathetic fibers that are visceral stimulation. So we have the greater superficial vitrosal and the remainder of those parasympathetic fibers travel along with the corda tympani to go to the submandibular and sublingual gland for their innervation. Sometimes we can see those branches again on a reconstruction. So here on the descending mastoid segment, we see the little stapedius branch, and here we see that corda tympani branch coming off the descending or mastoid segment of the facial nerve before it comes out of the stylomastoid foramen. So here's a video I made. You can take a paper clip and unfold it to actually make a facial nerve. So if we unfold this paper clip, we can actually see those branches of the facial nerve as they extend out. So if you're ever trying to explain the facial nerve course, this is your facial nerve. So we have a canalicular segment through the IC, then a labyrinthine segment to the anterior genu, a tympanic segment going back, and then a posterior genu with a descending or mastoid segment coming down. So this is your left facial nerve as it comes out. So uh, that is a quick review of the anatomy there of the facial nerve. So we remember we can think about the facial nerve differently at different components, either the external auditory canal, the middle ear, and the inner ear structures, or we can think about the different osseous components that make up the temporal bone itself. So that's a quick review and a run through of the anatomy. And in our next lecture, we'll look at some of the common temporal bone pathology. And I thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions, Dr. Von Rensberg? Thank you, uh, Rick. Thank you very much for that comprehensive and simplified overview of the complex anatomy. Um, we still have a few minutes. Are there any questions, compliments? Please put them in your inbox and send them through. Eric, is anything coming up? Uh, yeah, just comments. Yes, sir. No questions. No, well, that's very complicated. It's a very interesting area, though, if we pay attention to this anatomy. And again, you'll see next time as we do the uh, pathology, if we have a bone algorithm, thin section CT, and we have a well done contrasted MR, I can sometimes tell you exactly what the pathology is. So that's a very exciting thing for us to be able to do. Yes, that's the name of the game. Uh, please read some of the comments out for us, please. Uh, just an excellent lecture and looking forward to next month. Uh, no actual questions. Really? Okay. This, this is so complicated. You guys know all of this now? Usually there are a lot of questions about the turbo bone. At this stage, Rick, I also want to thank you very much for allowing us to record this webinar. Uh, this will be available on our website for all our members, um, so you can always go back to this. And uh, our next uh, webinar will be 2nd of May, is that correct, Rick? Uh, yes, sir. I think right now we're set up for the 2nd of May to do the temporal bone pathology.
Thank but you. I did get one question about the uh, island for the lateral semicircular canal. So okay. if you don't mind, if I, I'll scroll back through some of my lectures. Try not to get dizzy. When we look at an axial CT and we think about where the vestibule is in the lateral semicircular canal, the osseous bar that's inside of the lateral semicircular canal should be wider right to left than the vestibule is right to left. Sometimes we just see a big cyst. It turns out that the lateral semicircular canal forms last. So uh, it's the most commonly to see a cystic aplasia or hypoplasia of the lateral semicircular canal. Sometimes the superior and the posterior semicircular canals will be normal, but the lateral, because embryologically it forms last, we may have an aplasia or hypoplasia, and a subtle dysplasia that's often missed is partial agenesis of that lateral semicircular canal, where that osseous bar is not bigger right to left than the vestibule is right to left. So that's our internal standard. Uh, another question about fluid in the, the mastoid antrum. We'll talk about that more in our next lecture, but just seeing fluid in the mastoid air cells is not actually pathology. And we wanna be very careful that we don't call mastoiditis just by seeing fluid in the mastoid air cells at that level. Just seeing fluid in the mastoid air cells, like maybe there's a little bit of fluid in this image we're looking at, that is not mastoiditis. We let the surgeons make that decision even if that fluid enhances. It turns out there's a little bit of respiratory mucosa in both the middle ear and the mastoid air cells. So that respiratory mucosa we think about is sometimes being a little bit weepy if you think about it that way. And we may get a little bit of fluid and edematous changes from that mucosa, but that is not the same as mastoiditis. Uh, there was another question, uh, high riding jugular bulb. I use the floor of the uh, internal auditory canal. So when I look at the internal auditory canal, if I see the jugular bulb extending above the floor of the IAC, then I call that a high riding jugular bulb. So if the entire jugular bulb goes up above the floor of the IAC or internal auditory canal, I call that a high riding. And then if there's a diverticula extending from the jugular bulb up, then I call that a jugular diverticula. That's high riding. And I use the floor of the internal auditory canal. Now, there's another question about how do you distinguish a less than homogeneous otic capsule from a normal cochlear cleft or subtle early otospongiosis? Uh, that's very complicated. Great uh, question, Dr. Hannes. Uh, we'll talk about that more next time. But when we think about the otic capsule, the very dense bone that is around the cochlea and the vestibule, we want it to be very uh, bright white all the time. And if we have a subtle area where we've lost bony density, like otospongiosis or otosclerosis, it often starts at the fissula antifenestram, the small fissula in front of the window, and then it spreads around the cochlea and the vestibule. If you divide up those types into a fenestral and a cochlear otosclerosis or otospongiosis, we think about those different uh, spectrum of pathology. Uh, so some people talk about the otic capsule, the dense bone that's around there. It's sometimes hard to differentiate early otospongiosis uh, from a cochlear cleft. We'll talk about that in the next, next lecture. Some people describe a little diverticula off the front of the internal auditory canal. But when we think about where otosclerosis or otospongiosis starts, that's at a specific area, the fissula antifenestram, the small fissure in front of the window, and we'll talk about that in our next lecture. Well, Rick, thank you very much. Obviously, there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, for the next lecture. Your time is precious. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience. Um, and uh, have a good day, and we'll see you in a few weeks' time. You too. Thank you so much.